So I'm in San Francisco with Guy Vince, author of Adventures in the Anthropocene, or as in England they say the Anthropocene. To me it's kind of germane that we haven't even figured out how to pronounce the word yet. That's how new this whole notion is. Can you summarize very basically the, the key notion that led you into this? Well, so I, I was a news editor at um, Nature magazine and uh, I was getting across my desk all kinds of scientific papers showing us that uh, the big changes that are happening and yes, climate change was one of them, also biodiversity loss, another species going extinct, we're creating another species of plant using genetic modification, river flow is changing, sediment levels are changing, all these different things were happening and I realised that there was one central agent that was common to all of these and it was us, it was humans, it was we were the ones changing the planet, having a planetary effect. And I thought that was really interesting and, and so I wanted to find out a little bit more about how we're doing this and who is at the forefront of all these changes and what are we going to do, how are we going to survive, how are people already experiencing these changes. So I left my job, I left London and I set off on a two and a half year journey, it turned out, around more than 40 countries uh, to, to meet the people living the experience of the Anthropocene. And, um... We'll start at the end. What's your sense of, or do you see this with a sense of doom, a sense of pure engagement, intellectual puzzle engagement, or um, what's your kind of feeling of what's happen happening oh, All here? of that, all of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, it is, it, there is no doubt that we're changing the planet in ways that are already causing people great suffering and, and animals. But at the same time, I think, I have this huge sense of optimism because I've seen the incredible ways that people are using their ingenuity to get around problems, that we are an ingenious species, we're incredibly adapt adaptable, we, uh, we have been changing the planet in different ways, locally and, and in small ways, ever since we evolved. And now we've scaled this up, now we're having planetary effects. Um, I don't doubt that it's going to be hard, but I, I am optimistic, yeah. And anyone I know who's been at this, including myself, has found along the way certain moments or certain things that you report on that are just absolutely devastating and certain moments that are incredibly exciting. I don't know if you want to give an example of one or two of both of those. Well, so uh, devastating. Look at the way that um, I, I've been to villages where, where people have had to move to join the great urbanisation that's happening, but they're not moving to a nice apartment in uh, a thriving metropolis. They're moving to um, a bit of sand on the outskirts with um, some plywood, which they're constructing a house out of. Uh, they're living with no sanitation, no electricity, often uh, no water supply. Um, I, I've, I've spoken to people who are living on perilous atolls in the Pacific Ocean or the Indian Ocean who are watching their land disappear. They, they, they will no longer have a nation and, and what does that mean? It means uh, they won't be able to go to where their ancestors were buried, they won't be able to speak their language, they won't have their nursery rhymes, their fairy stories, they're witnessing the end of their culture. I mean, these are devastating and this is the first time it really uh, we're facing this. There have always been immigrants, we're, we're a migratory species, but there's always been a sense of home, even if we can't go there, even in that generation or the next generation, there's always that sense of home. If that home no longer exists, what does that mean? for us, what does it mean for a species? Um, but at the same time I've seen incredible things, I've seen people at the forefront of enormous changes figuring out ways to, uh, to continue to, to preserve their culture in the face of a, a human crisis. Um, for example, in Ladakh, in northern India, a corner on the, on the uh, edge of uh, Pakistan um, of, of India, China and Pakistan, a, a contested region, Ladakhi people who have witnessed their glaciers disappearing. I've seen a retired railway worker who is, who is now building artificial glaciers, which is giving them enough irrigation water 
to allow them to stay in their village and not migrate to a shanty town on the edge of Delhi or Mumbai. Right, right, right. And, um, you know, one of the biggest challenges is the climate problem because of the, uh, well, as you know, it's got all these parameters to it, the long-lived nature of CO2, the um, fact that it's a global commons tragedy where everyone contributes but the impacts are dispersed. And um, Is there any aspect of that that you see that's out, a little different from the kind of woe is me, shame on you meme, which has been kind of the dominant thread there. You know, it's Exxon's fault or it's... Um... Well, I mean, initially we didn't set out when when uh, the first steam engine was dis was invented, when when um, coal was discovered to burn, nobody set up and thought, I know, what we'll do is we'll warm the global climate. Of course not. You know, it's nobody's fault in that sense. What's happened is that we found this incredibly rich source of energy, this brilliant fuel, and it, and it turns out to have a an unappreciated at the beginning a, a side effect of warming the planet we now realize what that problem is we are engaging yes it's been slow but we are engaging um, the climate conference uh, which ended last week already bought brought some sort of agreement and that is significant that really is even if it doesn't mean that we're going to stay i don't believe we're going to stay below two We'll be lucky yeah. if we stay below three. I think that's unlikely at the moment, mm -hmm. unless there's a big change. But there could be a big mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly what the future holds. We do know that we can change quickly as a, as a species. And when I say quickly, I mean on geological terms, we're quick. Yeah. We can we can get a way out of this. Will it mean geoengineering? Will there be a success in something like fusion? Will we figure out a way to make uh, solar energy more efficient, cheaper and more robust? Will we find um, brilliant sources of energy storage, new forms of battery? Maybe. Will we change our socio-economic system? We don't know. We don't right. know. But we have to hope, because what's the alternative? That we resign ourselves to this situation? Right. Well, one thing I noted about the, this latest treaty meeting was um, well, two things. One was there was the first time I've seen research and development investment being something that was pushed for the longest time. This was seen as a social, political will, economic kind of thing. If we just put a price on carbon or just all get into the streets, we'll solve the global warming problem. But here, there was the it was the first time, and I've been tracking this too long, where the basic research, uh, the gap, people were acknowledging needs to be filled, which gets at what you were saying about science, like basic science. What do you think about the state of the world's engagement with that? You know, is it what would we need to get sufficiently engaged there if you don't think it is enough right now? I think as humans, we are very clever in certain ways. We have um, completely modified our world, and we're continuing to do that. Our technological prowess is is legendary, but we have a very Stone Age brain. <laughs> Yeah. We are incapable, really. Uh, the best minds can, and some people can, but we are incapable of thinking of the future, planning for the future. The future is already happening now. We can see it, and that we can see in our engagement has already ramped up a gear. But it's hard enough to think of our grandparents' mortality, let alone our parents' mortality, let alone our own mortality. So think about this process, and we're not thinking just in the next 10, 20 years. We're now on a pathway of uh, CO2 emissions that will affect us for centuries to come. Right. You know, to care about that, to understand that, and to not just understand it intellectually, but to understand it emotionally is a big challenge for a human being. We might be very clever, we might be able to go to the moon, and we might understand time, understand death, but to really engage with these problems at an emotional level is it's actually really, really hard for us to do. We do have quite a primitive brain in that respect. Um, I don't know about for you, but for me, that was one of my significant kind of aha moments. Came in the mid-2000s, sort of 2005, when I realized I'd spent too much time focused on telling the story, the biogeophysical story of climate change, and not the psychological, moral, philosophical story. Did you start this project 
with both of those things in mind? Or I did. I'm, I'm really fascinated um, at the, with the nexus. I mean, I, I trained as a, as a scientist, but I'm, I'm really fascinated at how science and humanity collide. And um, I mean, for, for, for centuries, science was considered a cultural thing. You know, you, science or drawing or music, these were all cultural attributes. It's, it's really quite recent that we've separated the science and the arts, but actually, yeah. um, they're all parts of being human, and and how that how that interacts with um, economics, with our history, with the way that we live as a society. I think these are all really important questions, and they're very very interesting to me. So with my book, it was really important to me that I that I wrapped up this this very human subject. The Anthropocene really is about about the changes, the physical, biological, and chemical changes to our planet caused by this species, and to understand. How, how we're doing it and to understand what's going to happen to our planet, we have to understand what it means to be human. And we're not just another species. We're not a, a goat or a, or a, a cat or, or something fairly predictable. We have human needs. We have human desires. You know, people want um, a BMW. They want um, a mobile phone. They want um, a microwave. People have these desires, and these desires change, they grow, we, we're susceptible to all sorts of human pressures and human needs, and if you don't accept that, you don't understand that, then you're not going to solve any of these, these scientific problems, because you have to understand how humans relate to the planet. It's a human cause problem, and it's a human, it's, we will be the solution.